Hey guys, my name is Emma Zrizzly and in this video I'm going to be showing you 5 things you should know in Photoshop when you're just starting out. Hey guys, welcome back to my YouTube channel. I hope everyone is doing well and staying creative. Today, we're gonna to be talking about Photoshop basics. So this video has been highly requested because I've been making a few Photoshop tutorials talking about different tools. So hopefully this video will help you better understand the videos I've made in the past and also the videos I'll be making in the future. The things we're gonna be talking about today are things that I wish I knew when I was starting out in Photoshop and they're also tools I use every day when I'm editing my photos. So everything I'm gonna be showing you today is on the latest Photoshop, which is Photoshop 2020. But the principles and ideas that we're gonna be talking about mainly are still relevant in all other previous Photoshop versions. So before we jump into the computer, let's just quickly talk about why I use Photoshop and when I would use it when editing photos. So I use Photoshop to adjust my photos and create composites. So if you want to do more than just color grading your images, which I use Lightroom for, Photoshop is a really great way to take that extra step in your editing process. So things I do in Photoshop include removing people or removing distractions from photos, creating composites with lots of layers, making new worlds and creating new things from your photos, even things like replacing a sky or adding birds or just adding little things to your photos that just make it more imaginative. I find that it's much easier to learn Photoshop when you actually have an idea for where you want to go with your edit to begin with. So let's say at the beginning of this edit you want to flip your city upside down. So if you have that idea already then it's much easier to achieve what you want to achieve in Photoshop. At the same time, if your idea changes along the way, that's also fine. But I think the best way to learn Photoshop is to have an idea first, and then you go into Photoshop and start playing around and trying to achieve that final result. All right, so with that in mind, let's jump on the computer and let's talk about the five things you should know in Photoshop when you're just starting out. So to talk about these five topics we're gonna be covering in this video, we're gonna be making this edit right here. So the first thing we're gonna be talking about is layers. Layers is probably the most basic and most important thing you need to know about Photoshop and creating composites. The easiest way to understand layers is probably if you think about when you were back in primary school or kindergarten when you're cutting out shapes and making collage that's probably like a real life example of layers and that's what we do in Photoshop so when you're cutting out shapes and pasting it on top of each other each new shape or each new piece of paper is a new layer pretty much so now let's jump into Photoshop and we'll talk about layers in more detail all right first let's talk about how I usually open files in Photoshop 99% of the time I open images in Photoshop through Lightroom because I usually color grade the raw files first and then I make my adjustments in Photoshop Lightroom and Photoshop work very well hand in hand and after you finish editing on Photoshop and click save your new edit will appear as a new TIFF file in Lightroom for you to export all right so I've already color graded both images that I want to use in Lightroom so now let's open it in Photoshop right click and click edit in and then edit in Photoshop I open both or all the images I want to composite together all right so now we've got both files open let's copy the second image into the main file to do this select all using controller command a and then copy controller command C and paste control command V into the first file. So now you can see in the bottom right panel that there are two layers. This panel is a layers panel. The first thing we're gonna do is to unlock the background layer by clicking this padlock icon. This makes working with the layer much easier. Then let's rename both layers by double clicking on the text. I'm gonna name the bottom layer background and the top layer foreground. It's really helpful to get into a habit of renaming your layers, especially when you start working on more complicated edits. This will just keep your file more organized and help you get less confused what layer you're working on. Okay, so what can we do with these layers? We can turn them off and on by clicking the eye icon here. You can also adjust the opacity and make the layers more transparent. You can either type a percentage into the text box or you can just drag and slide your mouse left and right on top of the word opacity to make it more or less transparent. There are also these blending options if you click this drop down menu, which allows you to blend your layers together with different effects. Just hover over each one and see what it does. We're going to be using one of these blending options later in the edit. It's also very important to know which layer is selected and being affected when you're editing. So if something's not working, you should always check which layer has been selected. Okay, so now we understand how these layers work. I'm going to crop and compose this image before moving on to the next topic. So I click on the crop tool on the left toolbar, make sure 4x5 is selected on the top and delete crop pixels is turned off and then I crop the image to 4x5 ratio. Turning off delete crop pixels means that you will be able to recrop the image later on and won't lose any parts of your image. This is called non-destructive editing and we're gonna be talking about that in more detail later on in this video. Next, I'm just gonna flip the foreground image horizontally because I wanted the subject to be on the lower right of the image and to do this, I right click and click free transform or hit control and command T and then right click again and click flip horizontal. And then I lower the opacity of the layer so I can see the background. Next, I added some rule of thirds guidelines to help with placing the subject. To do this, I go to view at the top and then click new guide layout. Make sure you set the row and columns to three and three and then click okay. 
Then you want to use the free transform tool again to position the foreground layer into place. You can also rotate it and scale it a little bit as well. We're going to be diving deeper into the free transform tool later in this video as well. Alright, so now we have the positioning and composition. Clear the guidelines by going up to view up the top and then clear guides. And now let's move on to the next topic. Alright, so the next thing we're going to cover is making selections. Just like the paper analogy before, cutting out the shapes with scissors is basically the same thing as making selections in Photoshop. There's a number of ways to make selections from being super precise to being more loose, but there's no right or wrong way to do it. As long as you're happy with the selection and you make the right selection, that's completely fine. So today I'm going to be showing you how I usually make selections and the different options Photoshop gives you when making selections. So let's get into it. So here I'm going to be selecting the subject so we can isolate him and control his look and tone separately. The first thing I'm going to try is this new remove background button in the properties panel. If your background is clean and simple, this button should work fine. But since the image is quite foggy and the subject is not well defined, it's giving me this error. So what I'm going to do next is to separate the subject from the foreground layer. So click the rectangular marquee tool and then draw a box around the person and then right click and then click layer via copy. This will make a new layer with just that selection. Okay, so before we create the selection of the subject, let's talk about other tools you can use to make selections. Usually this magic wand tool and the sub tools inside would be what I would try. There's this quick selection tool where you can just click and drag your cursor and it will try to snap it to contrasting edges in your photo. And there's also the magic wand tool itself where you click a certain color and then the Adobe AI will try to select all the same color that you just picked. You can change the tolerance level so it selects more or less. And you can also turn off and on this contiguous button to select the same colors only around where you clicked or the same colors in the entire image. All right, now let's select the subject. To do this, I click on the new layer we made, and then I click on the select subject button in the properties panel. You can also find the same button if you click the magic wand tool in the top menu bar. Once clicked, Photoshop will try to select the subject on that layer automatically. In this case, it's done a pretty good job of selecting around the person. You can then tidy this selection up further by using the polygonal lasso tool. By holding onto shift and clicking, you can add to the selection, or if you hold alt and click, you can subtract from the selection. Take your time with this and get your selection looking right. Alright, so the next thing we're going to be talking about is non-destructive editing. I find that the most useful and biggest thing in Photoshop is how we can edit in a non-destructive way. This means if you make a mistake or need to tweak something, you don't have to go back and click undo or erase. You can just rework it and keep tweaking it until you get the right result you want. So there's going to be two things we're going to be talking about in this non-destructive editing part, and it's going to be layer mask and adjustment layers. So yeah, let's get right into it and I'll show you how to use these tools. Okay, so now we've got our selection, we can click this layer mask button to isolate the subject. You'll see this box appear next to the layer preview. This is the layer mask for this layer. It means that if you have this layer mask selected and you paint black on a certain part of the layer, it will hide that certain part. And if you paint white, it'll show it again. To show how layer masks work in a better way, we're going to be using this foreground layer. Once the layer is selected, click on the layer mask button. Then click the paintbrush tool, make sure the color on top here is black, and then right click the image to select the size of the brush and the hardness. I usually go for hardness zero to make it blend better. Then I just start painting black onto the image. This will reveal the background below and mask out the foreground layer. If you make a mistake and erase too much, then you can click X on the keyboard to toggle between the background and foreground layers. And in the case of a layer mask, it's between black and white. So when the white is the color on top, you can paint stuff back in and fix the mistakes. Keep playing around with the brush sizes until you get the look you want. With a bigger brush, you can paint further away and get better feathering and fade. You can also see that because we isolated the subject to a new layer, it won't erase the person from the image. All right, so next let's talk about adjustment brushes. For a few years when I started using Photoshop, whenever I wanted to adjust the tones or colors of a certain layer, I would go to the top and go to image, adjustments, and then pick from one of these. For example, hue saturation. And then I'll just adjust the sliders in the menu. But over time, I found that the better way to do this is by using adjustment layers. To do this, click on the adjustment layers button on the bottom right, and it'll give you the same options as the previous menu you saw at the top. So now let's click hue saturation. Once that new layer appears, you can change the settings from the properties panel here. If you want to just affect the layer just below it, then you can right click the adjustment layer and then click create clipping mask. Now when you adjust the settings, only the layer below it is affected. The main advantage of using an adjustment layer is that if you make a mistake or if you want to go back and retweak something, you can just pick up where you left off previously and just adjust the sliders again. Okay, so next I'm going to add a brightness contrast adjustment layer and then adjust that too. Then I also want to adjust the colors of the whole foreground, including the person as well. So I select the subject and the foreground layer and then click on this folder icon to group it together. We can then also apply adjustment layers to the groups using the same method. Just play around with the different adjustment layers and keep tweaking the settings until you're happy with the color matching. 
All right, so the fourth thing that we're going to be talking about is the free transform tool. I already showed you a couple of different things we could do with the free transform tools in this video, but let's dive in a little bit deeper and talk about the different options in the free transform tool. All right, so to demonstrate what we can do with the free transform tool, let's adjust and position the background. So first click on the background layer, and then you can either right click and select free transform, or you can click Ctrl or Command T. When you see these nodes appear, then you can start moving that layer, scaling it proportionally by dragging the nodes, or scale it in one direction by holding shift and dragging. You can also hold control and pick a specific node to move that one node wherever you want. Then if you right click, there are also these other options you can choose from too, like skew, perspective, distort, and warp. Each one does something different and helps with positioning or composing your image. So just have a play with each one and use the ones you want to help with your composition. You can also free transform groups of layers if you've made a folder or if you just select more than one layer. And also if you make a selection in one of the layers, for example, this box, you can just transform that selection as well. This is what I did here when I stretched the left side of the foreground to fill the frame. I use the free transform tool pretty much every day and understanding how this works will help a lot when using Photoshop. So the last thing we're going to be talking about are the different tools in the toolbars that I use the most and also the filters that you can use as well. These are used on just a case by case basis depending on what you want to do in Photoshop. Okay, so let's go through the tools here on the left toolbar. We've spoken about the marquee tool, the polygonal lasso tool, the magic wand tool and the crop tool already. So now let's look at the other tools I usually use to edit my photos. First there's this eyedropper tool which you can use to sample a certain color. All you have to do is just click wherever you want to sample and then you can grab the paintbrush tool and just start painting using that color. Next, there's the spot healing brush tool. This is super handy when you want to remove small distractions or dust marks from your images. All you have to do is just paint over the spot you want fixed and Photoshop will automatically fix it for you. Just like the paintbrush tool, you can right click and adjust the size and hardness for the spot healing brush tool too. Then there's the clone stamp tool. This is used to clone parts of your image to another part of the image. For example, if I want to make this building taller, I can just clone this part here by holding onto Alt and then clicking to select my sample area and then let go of Alt and start painting here. It's essentially just cloning the part you sampled into the new location you're painting on. So the last tool I'll talk about from this toolbar is the blur tool. I usually use this just to blur hard edges like the outline of the subject here. It helps with blending images together and making it look more realistic. Again, you can also adjust the size and hardness by right clicking. All right, next let's talk about the content aware fill tool. This is similar to the spot healing brush tool, but I feel it does a better job when working with larger areas. So for example, if I want to remove this long bright grass from the bottom right because I find it distracting, I just select around it using the polygonal lasso tool, and then I right click and then click fill. When this menu appears, make sure content aware is selected and click OK. It should erase it automatically. If it doesn't work, you can always try it again or even use a clone snap tool. But usually when there's some sort of pattern or it's an easy background, it removes it quite well. I'm going to do the same thing for the corners of the background as well to fill in the rest of the image. And I'm also going to do the same thing here with the bush next to the subject. Make sure you disable the layer mask first by right clicking and then disable layer mask. Then do the content aware fill method. And once you're done, enable the layer mask again. All right, so now let's talk about filters. We're going to be applying a filter to the background layer. So the first thing I'm going to do is to duplicate this background layer. To do this, I right click the background layer and then click duplicate layer. Next, I'm going to make this duplicated layer into a smart object by right clicking and then click convert to smart object. This will make applying filters easier and non-destructive. So if you want to keep adjusting the filter, it's much more convenient and quicker. So now with that duplicated layer selected, go up to the top and click filter. There's a bunch of options here and in my previous videos, I've already covered the radial blur, motion blur and a little bit of the Gaussian blur filter. But today we're going to be going in the blur gallery and then using the path blur filter. Each filter in this menu will do different things, so just have a play and experiment with each one. Okay, so with this path blur menu open, what we're going to do is just drag lines that match the perspective of the background. In this case, I draw five lines and I just leave the settings as the default. But if you wanted to increase or decrease the blur, you can adjust the settings on the right. Once this filter is applied, you can adjust that layer by playing with the opacity or even free transforming it to make it slightly larger. Or if you wanted to, you could apply a layer mask and erase some parts of it and only make the tops of the building blur, for example. In this case, I made the opacity about 30% and made the layer slightly larger to give the effect that the buildings are coming towards the subject. If you wanna adjust this filter further, you can just double click on the path blur filter on the layer. All right, so the last thing we're gonna be doing to this edit is to add a bit more fog to the image. To do this, I went to Google Images and typed in fog black background and saved a couple of them and then I just dragged them into the file from Windows Explorer or Finder. I then picked the blending option screen to remove the black part. Next, I place this fog layer at the top of the foreground folder so that the adjustment layers we made earlier that affected the folder will also affect this fog layer too. And then I applied a layer mask and painted the hard edges from the sides. Then I used the free transform tool to adjust the position and the size. 
I also made the opacity super low at about 15 to 20 percent. I then repeat this again with another fog image. Just take your time with this and keep adjusting until you get the right look you want. This is completely subjective and up to you to showcase your creativity. Alright so we're done. I click file and then save and then a new TIFF file should appear in Lightroom where I do a final color grade and then export. And here's the final edit. Alright, so I hope you found that tutorial useful and I hope this video have made Photoshop less intimidating and help you make that extra step in your photography editing. I'm going to be making more videos in the future, diving deeper into different tools and maybe create a part two and make a Photoshop basic series. If you have any questions or if you want to learn anything specifically from me in the future, drop them in the comments below. If you like this video, make sure you give it a thumbs up and if you want to see more coming soon, make sure you subscribe to the channel. As always, thanks so much for watching and remember to always push your creativity to the next level. Bye!